Welcome everyone. We appreciate your time uh, today and taking time out of your busy schedule to join us today to help improve your science communication skills. On behalf of the United States Aquaculture Society, the National Aquaculture Association, and the Alabama Cooperative Extension System, we welcome you and just want to let our presenter, Eric Heupel, know how much we appreciate his time and expertise in designing science presentations uh, both written and uh, PowerPoint and all sorts of other graphic media uh, transmissions. Um, sounds like Eric has done a lot of different things, but he specializes in helping people communicate science, working for journals and other scientific publications. And today he's going to share with us a little bit about uh, how to make our visual, for sure, uh, presentation skills uh, better. And with that, Eric, if you would like to uh, do any more introduction, feel free, but I will go ahead right. and turn it over to you and drop into the background. Thanks so much. Thank for you, Dave. Yep. So presentation designs for science. Um, get this thing started. Who am I and how am I giving you anybody else's type of advice? So I grew up as the son of a pair of artists. Uh, it's not what they necessarily did as their professional careers, but that's what they do now. And they're both very successful. Um, I do traditional media, watercolor, pen and ink, pencil, things like that. Um, I spent a time as a freelance animator. Uh, probably the most widespread known thing that I worked on was uh, a Saturday morning cartoon based on the Starship Troopers uh, world called Roughneck Starship Troopers. I was a freelancer for that project. Um, I used to work for Micron Electronics and Micron Memory uh, and did a lot of video for them, training videos, regional commercials for other clients, uh, web design for Fortune 1000 on down companies. Um, I'm also a PhD candidate in oceanography. After I moved back to the East Coast for family reasons, I decided I wanted to go back and pursue my original love of oceanography. Um, and so that's what I'm wrapping up right now. Um, and I'm a scientific illustrator, so combining the PhD in oceanography and the love of, of oceanography and science with the artistic skills that I have. All of this really means diddly in terms of authority, except for to tell you where I'm coming from and what my experience is, so you can put that into perspective. Um, as scientists, researchers, etc., we are communicators. Uh, yes, we do the primary research, but then it's also our job to communicate that, whether it's to our peers or to uh, stakeholder groups. Uh, I worked for a while as a postdoc doing fishery science, so I was working with all sorts of stakeholders. Um, traditionally, our main medium is in writing, and that's where we get 90% of our training in communication is written, long-form written prose. Um, and, you know, class assignments when we're students, feedback from teachers, feedback from colleagues, feedback from mentors, editors, reviewers, all of those. We usually, by the time you've got uh, a little bit of time and a little bit of training, become competent and some of us amazing writers. Well, not me, I'm a competent writer, but unfortunately, we also need to uh, teach and do outreach and spread the word of what we've done our research on. And so that involves a lot of lecturing, giving talks, seminars, giving uh, meetings to, to stakeholders or to classrooms, things like that. We get a lot less training, at least in the sciences. I don't know about the outreach people that, that that's their job, but uh, those of us in the science, we get a lot less training on giving talks, but we still get some. Um, but we also need, and especially in today's world, even more so, need to present in exclusively or largely visual mediums. You know, YouTube and Instagram and all of these things are becoming more powerful for outreach and more important for outreach to get to the average layman who needs, needs to hear what we've got or wants to hear what we've got. And then on top of that, we've got posters and presentations, which are largely visual. I mean, the narrative is still coming from you when you're at the poster talking, but if you're not at the poster, it's purely visual. And PowerPoint slideshows are 
largely visual and most people hang on those visuals and tend to tune out to what you're saying if your visual is too busy. So graphic design can help you or it can get in your way. Uh, bad poster designs get ignored. Bad PowerPoint designs bore the audience or worse, make viewers walk out at a talk or sit there on their computer answering emails, filling out grant forms, things like that. And actually bad PowerPoint uh, can kill. Um, it, it, the, the, uh, the shuttle mission, when we look back at all the stuff and doing the testing on the tiles, it was a bad PowerPoint design that basically made people go, oh, okay, everything's good. So what is good design? Because there's bad design and good design. So what is what makes the difference between them? Good design is several things. It is intentional. And this is whether it's for a product, a journal, a poster, any of those things, good design, it carries across. Intentional means carefully chosen features and elements that enhance the product design or enhance the communication ability of, of your presentation and its usefulness to the audience. It's empathic, it's user-centered. The choices are made to enhance the user's experience, the user's interaction with the, with the information or with the product. It's iterative. Just like the best writing is rewriting, the best design is redesigning. You keep what works, you refine what didn't, or you get rid of it. And then you keep on doing that on an iterative basis. Um, start off doing it for yourself, write your own, you know, do your own slideshow, run through it, then give it to a couple of colleagues. They give you some advice, you reiterate, then you give it to a small group in your local community, you reiterate, then you go and give it to a larger group on YouTube or at a big conference, things like that. It's, it shouldn't be your first time at the rodeo when you give that to a big audience. Good design is consistent. Um, it has a consistent feel, a consistent look for whatever the product line is. In terms of our design in scientific visuals, that means that you use fonts consistently, you use color consistently, you have consistent white space, things like that. Um, it's unobtrusive. The design should facilitate the use and interaction with the product, whether that's a poster or a, or a science talk uh, slideshow, or whether it's a KitchenAid mixer, which, you know, KitchenAid mixers have been the same, you know, since largely the same since the 30s. They were the, the converse, pretty much the same, the same, same converse Chuck's look since the 1950s. They've iterated it. They've made minor improvements. They've made major improvements, but they've kept the design and the interaction the same. A couple quick quotes from some uh, designers that I look up to. Um, Brian Reed, who is a web front-end designer who I met down at South by Southwest several years ago. He also plays a mean bass. Everything is designed. Few things are designed well, which... Unfortunately, you can probably look around your office or whatever space you're in, and you can see lots of things you wish were designed much better. Um, Antoine de saint exupéry French writer and poet, best known in the United States for The Little Prince, Le Petit Prince. Um, but a designer knows he has achieved perfection, not when there is nothing left to add, but when there is nothing left to take away. And that is very true. Uh, and that leads into my favorite and probably the most influential designer on my outlook, which is Dieter Rams, who worked at, for 40 years at the um, Braun. And for 35 years, he was their chief design officer from a very young age. Uh, his most famous line and quote and what he lived by was Veniga aber besser, which translates to less but better. So let's look at what the where where the field is kind of now and has been for a while and where it's hopefully heading. So on the left, uh, we've got this fluorescent colors and all sorts of crazy on a background, whited out on a background that has light color and dark color and. I've tried to read this on the, in the full PDF version and it's really painful to read. 
versus the one with the puffin, um, which is a good design, a very good design. It has interest. It has a consistent color scheme. It has could have a little bit more white space if it was me designing it, if I'm picking it apart from a design point of view, but it's a very good communication uh, effect. They've done a great job communicating it. You notice the amount of text in this poster is very low. Um, it's it's a really an effective job. They did a great job with this. Here's another one. Uh, this one is of a poster that I would really love to be able to talk to the researchers on and figure out what was going on with it because they looked at old ship's logs and the temperature and and other climactic things that the ships had to log every every shift, if not more often, to reconstruct historic climatologies on the open ocean, which is an area that we have a hard time doing it. Um, but unfortunately, with the way that they've laid out this poster, I just I get lost and confused and and it drives me crazy. Whereas the other one uh, done by Jacqueline Gill and Benjamin Seliger uh, is very effective, good layout. You can see the flow of the information. They use horizontal rules and white space effectively to give you a good way of, of following the information flow. Uh, the one on the left with all the graphs and the, and the charts and everything, there's no real flow. You don't know where to go to next. Now, almost every time that I talk to somebody about poster design or, or PowerPoint design, it always comes down to, do you have a template I can use? No, I, I really don't. Uh, I, I could whip up a template, but it probably wouldn't work for you. It might help you a little bit, but you'd have to redo a lot of it. Every talk is different. Every poster is different. Every outreach group that you're talking to is different, and you need to tailor your talk or your poster to your audience as much as possible. So Joe's template won't work for Mary, Mary's won't work for John, your data is different than all of theirs, and you have more pictures or less, you have different critters, you have different colors in your images. So templates really don't work too well. Um, and all they really are is just a visual representation of the core rules of design. Here on the left is a template provided by Ginny Graphics. Um, it's really not a great template. Text is too small. Uh, the, you know, they've got an interesting column layout, which would work for certain topics, but it's not the best. On the right is one that I did in about an hour and 20 minutes uh, with content from this talk, basically, from a, a different version of this talk that I gave uh, at a conference recently. And like I said, it took me about an hour and 20 minutes with the content all in hand. So it, you need to set aside for a poster, you need to set aside a day to two days, maybe even three to once you have all your information to really design it and lay it out. Same thing with a PowerPoint talk. It's not something you just whip out. Um, templates only going to save you an hour or two at most once you know the basic rules uh, it's not going to do much good for you. So what are the basic rules? Well, from me, if you're getting ready to do a visual science communication of some sort, the, the basic rules are, first of all, read the presenter's instructions. If you're going to an event, if you're being, if you've been invited to give a talk or a poster or some presentation, or if you're going to a conference, find out what the conference or event organizers want in terms of printed and or presented information. Um, this is going to include things like maximum size of your poster, aspect ratio of the poster, minimum size, size of any display boards or walls that they're going to put it on, when to show up to hang your poster, when to take them down. Do they have a high definition projector, which most places nowadays do, but there are still places that don't, or standard definition. What version of PowerPoint are they using? What version of Windows? You want to test your presentation on that version of PowerPoint and on that version of Windows, which hopefully you've got an IT guy or you've got a computer available using those versions that you can test it on. Video formats that they support and know will work on their system versus some video formats are hit and miss. So that's, that's rule number one. Get your instructions, read them, 
be familiar with them. That's going to save you a lot of heartache down the road. Number two, your title is everything. Now, if you're giving an uh, invited talk, obviously not. If you're talking to a, a select group of, of stakeholders who really want to hear what you've got to say, also probably not as important. But if you're going to an event or a conference, especially if it's concurrent sessions or if it's a large poster event, your title is all that most people will see. You need to spend as much time on that title for your poster or your talk as just about on the abstract and the presentation of it. It needs to be short, but it needs to draw in the audience. The best thing that I've found is a simple statement of your key finding or your key question is usually best. A lot of people want to be cute and try and draw them in with a little bit of a joke or something like that in there. That can work, but it can also backfire. And especially if you're giving to an international audience, a lot of jokes and, and things like that, cute type of things, are keyed on colloquialisms, et cetera, that they may not get. So you're going to lose that. Most people are going to look through the, the conference or the event um, program, and they're going to read your title and keep on going. They won't even read the abstract if there are abstracts for the posters. So you need to make this draw them in and make them go, huh, that looks interesting. If you're doing it on a species or on a specific method, include the at least the common name preferably the scientific name of the species and or the method so that people know and get hooked on that. Number three, less but better. As Dieter Rahm said, most posters and most presentations have way too much text in them, either in them or on them. At most, a poster should be 700 to 800 words. I might, get, I might give you credit for a thousand if you do it well. Um, and that's the main content. That's not including the title or the references, um, but it does include captions. I would shoot, and I advise people to even shoot for 500 if you can. If you can say it more concisely and, and briefly, better off because people are reading and moving along. And once you've lost them, they move along to the next one. Um, you're not presenting a paper on a poster maybe a part of one, one line of experience or a proposal, or you're looking for feedback from others. Um, but you need to go ahead and wordsmith every sentence, eliminate unneeded sentences, remove unnecessary jargon. PowerPoint slides, 25 to 30 words is a pretty heavy PowerPoint slide. That's about the highest I would go. I have seen slides with 100 words or more, and that just puts people to sleep. Um, as for any graphics, figures, charts, um, keep them clear and legible and as simple as you can. Uh, I would avoid tables in both posters and PowerPoints, but especially in PowerPoints. Most tables, if it's enough information for you to tabulize it, it's probably too detailed and it's not going to be readable or followable on a PowerPoint slide. Related to less but better, more white space in part because of that desire to put more text in there and more images on a poster. Too many posters and slides have too little white space. Um, so you wanna, you wanna make sure that your content has room to breathe and that the white space, the gutters, the margins, uh, the space between paragraphs, things like that, helps define your content into columns and rows and guide the eye through the presentation. Um, this applies mostly to posters in terms of that type of guidance, but it still applies to PowerPoints. Um, you notice that I've got a lot of white space, even on this, which is going to expand to five bullet points. I've still got a lot of white space and minimal text. Go big. By this, what I mean mostly is fonts. Too many presentations, especially posters, but also PowerPoints, use fonts that are way too small for the purpose becomes less legible, less accessible. People tend to move along. You want it to be readable for a poster comfortably from two meters away, six feet. Um, for a PowerPoint, you want the person in the back of the room to be able to see it. If it's being projected by a, a good projector, that shouldn't be a problem as long as you can read it on your screen from say six to 10 feet away. If you can read the smallest text 
that matters. You might put uh, the captions and thanks and things like that much smaller because you don't actually want them to read it, but you want it in your presentation. Okay, that's fine. But if you want them to be able to read it, make sure you can read it off your screen from six to 10 feet away, then the projector should take care of everything else. I can't tell you, use a 36 point Helvetica font. I can't tell you that because font sizes vary depending on the font face and it just doesn't work that way. Now, I will get into a little bit more on that in a second. If you go to Google, you're going to find all sorts of recommendations, but I will tell you now, most of them are bad recommendations and will give you a bad result. The reason why I can't give you a set point size is because digital font faces, unlike traditional print, lead print font faces, have probably a 20, 25% spread. If I pick one font face, say Helvetica over here, and I pick another font face, say uh any any other i mean skia so like with helvetica and skia there's about a five percent difference in font size between them but some of the fonts that are out there are not designed well and some of them are designed well some of them are designed to be smaller on purpose some of them are designed to be larger and more open on purpose so there's a lot of reasons to design a font face specifically but in digital typeface if i say 36 point type there can be, when you print it out on a piece of paper, there can be a 20, 25% difference in the actual size that it's printed at. So for printing a poster or for putting it on a PowerPoint, it's hard to make a concrete recommendation. I've got four different examples of font faces that are all set to be one inch tall from the top of the, uh, from the baseline to the top of the highest, normal part, whether it's a, a sender for, the, for a lowercase or whether it's the capital. As you can see, they're all one inch high, but the aerial is 100 point. The PT Serif is 96 point. The Helvetica Noia is 102 point. The Skia, which is a little bit more of a, of a fancier face, is 105 points. So right here, we've got a 10% difference just within these fairly well-behaved front faces. So it's hard to make a concrete rule. Now, from work that I've done with the National Museum of the American Indian uh, and the Smithsonian doing some installations, for signage, a lot of the museums, including the Smithsonian and others, have come up with a set of rules for print material for the signage in museums. And based on that, you can take this directly for use in your posters. The title should be one inch tall, 25 millimeters. The headers should be two thirds of an inch tall. The body text should be at a minimum three eighths of an inch, but a half inch reads much better. The larger the font is, the easier it is to read, the quicker it is to read for your audience. And captions should be a quarter of an inch minimum. Now these are the museum guidelines. Um, but I found that they work very well for scientific posters as well. So having said that, if you want to use Helvetica or Helvetica Noia, we can come up with some, some guidelines for your, for your font size. So one inch is 102 points with Helvetica Noia. Two thirds inch is 67 points. A half inch is 51 points, which is where I would recommend you do your body for a poster. A quarter inch for your captions is 25 point. But that's only if you're going to use Helvetica Noia. Everything else, well-behaved fonts might be, you know, five or six points higher or lower than that to get the same thing. My recommendation is you print a sample of the font you want to use at the point size where you where it's going to, you think it's going to work. Put it on the wall, stand six feet away, make sure you can read it, or measure it with a ruler. And if it's within within a very close distance of, of what the one inch for a title, half an inch for your body text, then go for it, use it. So that's the quick five rules to start with. Let's expand on them a little bit. Does good design really matter? Uh, good design does matter, but it also requires education, training, practice. Anyone can learn the basic rules and play in whatever medium you want to, to develop a base ability. We do need to train science students, undergrads, graduates, and outreach people to be better in the world of design 
even though they may not be professionals at it, just so that they can create more engaging outreach material um, and work with existing designers, design students, et cetera, and do collaborations with them to get better design. So unfortunately, visual design is not science. It is mostly rules of thumb and it remains an art. Keys to design, good design, again, legibility at the target distance. So this is what we wanna go for. We want it to be legible. We want it to be simple. It's far easier to pull off a good design with a simple approach and simple underlaying design than it is to do something super fancy or faddish. Get the simple design done first, then you can embellish it with color, background images, et cetera. A good design has good color harmony, whether it's black and white or, or a split triad, it doesn't matter as long as it's harmonious. And use contrast, whether it's color or size or weight, the bolder versus not bold, and alignment to accentuate and highlight. But the first thing that I want to to touch on before we get into more on these individual items is common problems to avoid. Knowing what to avoid is oftentimes a big help in moving forward with a clean and better design. TLDR problem, the wall of text, I touched on it already. Keep your posters under 800 words, keep your PowerPoints per slide at under 30 words for sure, preferably under 25. Most pages, you really want to have three to five short bullet points, and that's about it. Don't, don't try and squeeze in bullet point seven and eight. It, it's going to make it worse. Word salad on that poster just makes people move along. Word salad in the PowerPoint, people are trying to read it off the screen instead of listening to you. The longer they spend reading and looking at the screen, the less they're spending actually focusing on your words that you're speaking so your narrative might get lost. You wanna avoid that at all costs. Again, with the for white space, let the elements breathe. Let them breathe deep, give them plenty of space. It helps with good design. It helps aid the flow of information and it helps with hierarchy and legibility. Better too much white space than too little. Color. I have seen so many presentations that just blast every color in the palette onto a presentation. Uh, I've even given presentations like that for another organization. I love that organization. I won't name them, but their slides, which I did not have time to completely redo, and it was not my job to redo them, were a cacophony of color. And that can be fun for five-year-olds and six-year-olds, but it, it also hurts the eyes. I recommend that you stick to three or four colors, a light, a mid-tone, a dark, maybe an accent, and then black and white or whatever colors you might choose to replace them. You might choose with a very dark purple because you love purple and a very, very pale purple, but it has to be very pale. Um, again, keep calm, follow directions. Whatever directions you've been given by the event, the conference, et cetera, or go out and seek those directions. With those out of the way, let's get to your actual presentation. First thing is strip it all away until all you have is your text, your narrative, and make it as concise as possible. Remember, you're looking at for a poster, 500 to 800 words. For a PowerPoint talk, well, that depends because you're gonna be giving the talk and you have a time frame, not a, not a space thing. But you wanna be able to, to see where you can fit your talk and any words that you have so that it'll fit your slide with having no more than 25 words per slide if possible. Only the essential graphics, just the graphics you need, the graphs or the figures to reinforce and tell your story, the core part of your narrative. No extra images that might help enhance that, just the ones that are essential. Once you've got those, we're gonna start very simple to build it back up and make it better, but still clean and stronger visually. First thing you're gonna do is choose one font. I, my suggestion to anybody who's not a, a designer or doesn't have a good eye for it is keep it within the sans family, sans serif. You don't, the sans serif fonts are workhorses 
they can be boring, they can be sort of plain, but they are very effective. And they're easier to work with because you don't have the little nuances of the serif fonts. There's arguments about whether which one's better. Personally, I love serif fonts. I love designing them and using them, but sans serif is hard to go wrong with for presentations. These are some good ones. Arial, Helvetica, Helvetica Noia, PT Sans, Open Sans, Futura. Um, they, they will all work and they will not steer you wrong. Avoid Googling best font for a design, best font for a poster. They're not aimed at us. They're aimed at the people who are doing concert posters or art posters or things like that. Um, a lot of the fonts that they're going to recommend are garbage for actual clear communication. Um, some of them might be okay, but how are you going to weed out the wheat from the chaff when it's 90% chaff? Um, they're not made for you. Please don't Google it. I mean, you're going to Google it anyways, but this was the first top thing that came up when I Googled it a couple of months ago. And out of the 70 fonts that they recommended, maybe six of them would have been appropriate for science communication outside of very narrow circumstances. So what do I recommend? My recommendations for Sans is Helvetica Noia or Helvetica. Gil Sans is a favorite of mine. Futura, Open Sans, Arial, PT Sans. These are all sans serif fonts, work very well. They're well behaved. You're not gonna have to go in there and tinker with the font or the kerning or things like that. It's a very straight up, straightforward font to work with. If you want to use serif, whether it's for titles or for contrast or for make something stand out, or if you want to use it for your main body, um, Garamond, Caslin, Badani, Sebon, Baskerville, and PT serif are all good, well-behaved fonts. Once you've got your font chosen, choose just one. We're going to go in there and set your title, set your heading, your author and institution and subtitles, your body and your caption. These are the sizes that I chose using Helvetica Noia to do for a poster. Uh, the same sizes, if you look, these, I mean, these are actually set at those sizes and I'm showing, to you, showing them to you th through PowerPoint. So they work very well for the same purpose here. And you can use them at the same font sizes for this purpose. Now you wanna double check it. Obviously for PowerPoint, anything over 28, 30 should work with a well-behaved font, but we're not doing big walls of text. We're doing minimum text. So go bigger, make it more legible, make it so that people can quickly read it and then focus on you and the words that you're telling because your narrative is the most important thing. Um, so this one is almost exclusively for posters because we're not setting walls of text in PowerPoint for sure. Line links in your columns matters in terms of readability. It's related to the size of the font. It's related to a lot of things, but as a general rule of thumb, at a minimum, you want 40 characters going across. At a maximum, you want about 75. So you've got that wiggle room. And when I say characters, I just type out a bunch of Xs. I make every tint X a different color, but a bunch of lowercase Xs going across my column so I can figure out my, what, how many characters per line I'm getting in my column. The ideal range based on a lot of research over the years is somewhere between 60 to 68 characters per line. Less than 40 reduces legibility and makes it makes it harder to read because you can't focus on a complete sentence basically and more than 70 75 makes it hard because your eyes lose track of where they were in the lines of of the paragraph as you go from one end back to the left side so there's a lot of research on that there's a lot of psychology to it there's a lot of physics physical and everything else but basically try and keep it 60 to 68 characters per line no less than 40 no more than 75 like i said almost exclusively for posters there. So that takes care of most of the issues with fonts, at least in terms of the basics. So white space, 
don't be afraid of it. Don't be afraid of leaving pockets of, of negative space. It does bring balance to a design, helps, helps offset and bring out the positive space, the areas where you do have actual content. One of the things is uh, white space is not just white. Uh, this is anything that is in the background, whether it's soft focus, blurry, solid color, or just plain white. They all count as white space. Even the lines between lines of text are considered white space. You can open them up a little bit. You can close them down a little bit. I don't recommend closing them down, but you can open them up sometimes to give more white space. And I oftentimes do. Um, so here in this particular picture, the text and the in-focus flower is where your eyes go, and that's where they focus to. The out-of-focus flowers get a little bit, that little arch of a stem that's going through that's a different color helps bring your eye back around to the text but everything else except for the flower head and the text are really white space and in the background one of the things about white space is you want to tie things together so white space in between your paragraphs in this particular example i have a set of texts that you don't need to worry about reading and then a title or subtitle section and then another set of text it's hard to see visually without reading the paragraphs which that title goes to the one above it is it a summation of that or is it a title for the next paragraph so you want to group like with like so even though i'm going to leave white space between the title and the next paragraph i'm going to pull those two closer together because that title does refer to the next paragraph which really defines it um, there is a hierarchy of information and you want to try and keep them tied together and you use white space to do that that's one of the things so there's more white space between the first paragraph and the title than there is between the title and the paragraph that it introduces or refers to little nuance type of thing but keep it in mind so uh, this is the redone one where i've lowered that amount of space in between them so now that white space gestalt title clearly is tied to the next paragraph text elements which is kind of a def definition of the white space gestalt so that covers everything really that we need to be able to put together a core our own template for a poster now we've got our all of our content we've gone through it we've wordsmithed it we've got essential graphics we might have a couple of, of secondary images that we'd like to include but let's see how the design goes first and we've picked a font, we've set our font sizes and everything else, we know what's going to happen. Now you start flowing it into two to four columns. Two columns is going to be a portrait poster only, four columns would be landscape only, but three columns can work for either and flow it into that. This is a basic, this is the basic block diagram of the poster that I showed you earlier where I made it out of this talk. And so I have an inch and a half margin at the top, a two and a half inch title area for the title and my name and the institution. I then have a, a gap, white space, maybe a little bit too big, but I've got a white space gap between that and my main content. Two inch margins on the side and the bottom completely, one inch gutters between each column. And then I have white space between the text and the, and the graphics important things to do and this can be made up like i said in less than an hour hour and a half the last thing to add to any visual is color this one we're going to go through kind of quickly because unfortunately color is its own not just talk color is its own one year college level graduate course there are more books published on color for artists psychology scientists etc i mean you've got spectrums you've got energy you've got warm versus cool you've got psycho psychological cues you have cultural cues you have visual issues because of visual acuity things uh color blindness of different types you have perception versus measured way too much for us to even even brush up against there are a ton of courses, textbooks, artist books, technical books, all on color theory. And then you get measuring color, the psychology of color, et cetera. International audience, different meanings of color based on different cultures. Separate topic, different talk, 
but be careful and know who your audience is if you can. So to really get very basic on it, the simplest color harmony is black and white. This is a wonderful image of the Grand Tetons by Ansel Adams. This man captured more beauty in black and white in one year on the road than most modern photographers will capture in their entire life with huge megapixel cameras and all the colors in the world available to them. And black and white works very effectively. Up from black and white, you have monochrome. All we're doing is replacing the black with a color hue. And so we have from very white to almost pure black, but it's all within one color hue. Um, basically, this is this is the simplest pure true color image. Now, Claude Monet worked a lot in monochrome and sometimes in analogous. This one, uh, the Japanese water lilies and Japanese bridge, is basically a monochromatic image. There's a little bit where some people would argue it's not, but this, the amount is so low that I I call it monochromatic. Um, next up, you have analogous. So the analogous is using a color family. So about 15 to 100 degrees on a color wheel spread. So you can go from greens into blues, or you can go from blues into, into purples. You can go from purple, you know, any of those work, but it's keeping right in there. I find analogous works well for poster design. And I pull my analogous colors out of images or out of the subject, research subject that I'm doing. This is a great uh, famous pic picture painting by Georgia O'Keeffe called Lake George. Uh, I first learned about it. It was called Reflection Seascape, but it is almost monochromatic. It is analogous. There is enough of that green in there and the, and the dark blue that it makes it really pop. But this is definitely an analogous color scheme. It is lovely and this works very well for posters and presentations powerpoint presentations then you can add a little bit of a contrasting color to really make it pop next color scheme would be complementary uh, here we're going to the opposite side of the color wheel for a couple of our colors so you, here i've pulled five colors three different tones of the same hue of blue and then two different tones from the opposite side which is going to give me a, a brownish orange a very famous example of this would be Vincent van Gogh's Starry Night. Uh, here you've got the blues, dark blues, and then you have the, the orangish yellows are your dominant colors throughout this whole thing. Even the, the blacks are almost a, a very, very dark brown in that orange family. Um, now, split complementary, we're starting to get into some of the, some of the more uh, advanced subjects but this is another great color scheme works well for presentations and posters remember when i said you can take your analogous or your other and you can pop a complementary color in we're here with the split complementary you might do that start with an analogous color scheme and then find the center of where that is on the wheel and go to the opposite side and pop that complement to be able to pull in as a contrast use it sparingly but use it where you want emphasis um, you can change your font color to that if it contrasts enough with the background or you can change the background etc uh, a, a brilliant example of this is <laughs> edward munch the scream now he did multiple versions of the screen but this is my favorite and probably i would say probably one of the more famous famous ones so the scream here is a split complementary system on blues and, and orangish reds uh, so the blues are the, the anchor, and then it goes up and it wises out to a red and a yellowish orange, and that's your split complementary. Also works a little bit harder to pull off, but it works. Double split complementary. Now we're getting really fancy. Five colors here. None of them are in the exact same hue. They all have a nice spread on them. This is starting to get a lot more advanced. It's harder to pull off. Uh, unless you you really play with it a lot and know what you're doing. But man, when you pull it off, as Tishian did here in Bacchus and, and Aridni, this is gorgeous with the blues and the greens on the one part of the split comp, uh, the double split complementary. And then on the other side, he's got the oranges and yellows with a little bit of the red in there. It really works. 
And this was intentionally done, um, brilliantly done, but hard to do, even for those of us who have virtually a lifetime or literally a lifetime doing art. Um, one thing you can do is go to one of these two websites or both of them. They both have a different version of a color picker and a, and a different way of helping you to come up with usually pleasing color schemes. I oftentimes will take a picture of my subject animal or study animal or study habitat and I'll load it in there and I'll pull up, pull out the colors that I want and try and come up with a nice color palette that lets that animal come through. And especially if I'm dropping that in as a back as a faded or blurred background image, I'll definitely do that. That way I have the colors are all integrated through. And then I'll pull a, a dark. A, a highly contrasting light color, a highly contrasting dark color, so that they pop against whatever my midtone color is, and there's enough contrast be between them so that they all will shine through. So let's put all of this together. We're going to do it in a poster, just because posters are easy for me to show examples of with the PDF. So this one is, you may not be able to read the text in it, but you should hopefully see, be able to read the this the section titles. Um, this was done by um, Broden uh, Schaefer, and he's at ASU, which at the time that he was doing this, ASU had very tight rules on the colors and everything else that you could use in a poster design. Within those, within those tight rules, he pulled off a wonderful poster, actually. And so in this design, he used the ASU red and gold, and they ASU also required him to stick to black, white, red, and gold. And so he used the gold as for the purpose and the conclusion, which are two of the most important items in your poster. And then he used the red for the other section. So he really brings your eye to the purpose and then the conclusion, and then you go back to the background and the results and everything else because of that gold standing out so boldly. Then he used the back, at, the black as the background for everything up above and the footer down below. ASU probably required him because it's a ASU Biodesign Institute and then ASU School of Life Sciences. They probably required all of those logos on there. I try and pull back from the number of logos that I put on promoting my school. My school is important, but I try and keep it to one, maybe two, um, but other than that, he did a brilliant job on this. There are little minor things that if I was a, a graphic design science communication professor, I might ding him here and there, but this is a wonderful design, especially with those tight constraints that he had. Um, this one, we've already touched on this one before. This is an excellent poster. I love the color theme. I like blues. I like puffins, but even bearing that aside with those biases, this is a wonderful color scheme that's all integrated together. The blue that he's pulled come, came out of the map, so it really works well with that. Uh, the map that's in the bottom of the left-hand column, that is. Um, he could put a little bit wider margins on the sides and on the bottom, but other than that, this is a great poster. I like the way that he overlaid the results on top of the puffin, but you can still see the puffin's legs through there. It doesn't distract me so much that I stop reading through the results and it really pulls and integrates everything together. It works very well in my opinion. Uh, somebody else might have a different opinion, but I think this is a, an example of a very good poster. Um, once again, here, this, this young man, Nicholas Wu, is done a number of posters like this where he's used a very specific photographic background that illustrates his his research uh, animal organism and he's done a very good job with it he is both a scientist and a scientific illustrator in his own right there are issues with doing reversed out text on an on a poster it tends to feel like it's much smaller because it is because of the process of printing that's used your text actually goes smaller so if you're going to do something like what he did here and you're going to have white on a dark background text make sure your contrast levels are high and it really stands out and pops and make sure you 
make almost all of your white reversed out text one more level of bold or a little bit larger font size than you normally would because the process of, of putting ink on that paper is going to creep into where your white font is because there is no white ink. There are only colored inks. So when, you, when you're printing like this, it's restricting the ink from that area, but all the rest of that ink around it will spread into it. So you want to really be careful about that, but he's pulled it off here and it's a very good poster. I would love to sit down with this gentleman and have a nice coffee because I've, I've loved his posters that he's done. So with that, I will leave you with an image of my chief editor or my editor and my chief critic. My other editor is on the floor here whimpering because I'm not playing ball with her and take any questions you might have. Well, that's awesome, Eric. That's uh, some very different perspectives than we're used to and in a whole different genre. And we, I think some people will take away uh, some very good points and lessons from your talk. Uh, if anybody has a question for Eric, you can either unmute and just ask, or you can type it into the chat box and I will try and relay it. Eric, it would appear you did such a good job that everybody is dumb. Or they're, or they're either afraid. that or, I, or they're the fire hose effect. <laughs> or they're afraid to ask. I have a quick question. Sure. Uh, th uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, I noticed in your list of fonts, you did not put uh, Times New Roman in there. And I wanted to find out why. And because that is one that I use and if, and if I need to stop using it, I, I'm down with that. I just need to understand no, why that Times was New not. Roman. Yeah, Times New Roman is a great font. It is another solid work workhorse. Okay. I mean, when that one was created for, oh, that was end of the 18th century. When that one was created, it was breathtaking and, and remarkable. It is still a solid workhorse in the Serif family of fonts. It's great for titles. It's great for a contrast. If you really want to set something aside, you know, print that one line or that one clause in a Serif font inside of a sans serif body and it it really makes it pop a little bit more um there are different ways to get that contrast using bold using italicized using a different font that works with the others um no times new roman is great it's just i went with the ones that are my off the top my favorites my go-to's because they're they're the ones that i work with more often than anything else i have one serif font that i absolutely adore and i use it on many i've used it on three out of the past seven science book covers that I've designed. And I simply love it, but I can't recommend it because it is a beautiful font and designed by one of my favorite typographers, but it can be a little bit of a pain to work with. So, you know, Times New Roman doesn't have that problem. It's easy to work with and it has a very classic look and feel. So I would definitely go that. Yeah, don't be afraid to find Times New Roman. It's good. Thank you so much. Yep. Eric, we did have one come in uh, through the chat box. It says, what do you think about using animations in PowerPoints? The students love. Uh, OK, so it depends on your audience. It depends on who you're trying to get to. Um, personally, I recommend for a conference of other researchers or other people in your professional level peerage group, I recommend not. Um, I also recommend minimal video. If the video is how you gathered it and it's really compelling, great, use it. If it's not really compelling or it's not how you gathered the information, I would say stick away from it. But the animations are really, animations were put into PowerPoint in the design and the development of PowerPoint, there's a lot of crap that got thrown in there that never should have. And animations are one of those things. It's like in video, I use a jump cut 95% of the time. I use the jump cut. 4% of the time, I use a fade to black and crossfade into a new scene. Those are 99% of all the work that I do in video is right there. That's it. 
I use special effects type of animations, which is what 90% of the PowerPoint animations are, only if there's a really compelling reason to do it. And that's my suggestion to you too. Only if there's a really compelling reason to do it. Now, if your audience is kids, it keeps them engaged sometimes, especially if you use a different animation each time and you've got the thing that bounces in and bounces out. But you're talking to kids and you're trying to engage them and keep them locked and they they have a much shorter attention span, although, you know, I have a 22 year old, so I'm not going to talk bad about him um, on a public forum. But, you know, it, it depends on who your audience is and play to your audience's engagement, keeping them engaged is the goal. But on a professional level to college students and other professionals, I'd say try and avoid them at all costs. Yeah. And I'm not sure. I'm not sure she was talking about fonts and or lines of text flying in but I, maybe maybe in the graphic illustrations of you know if you're layering yeah. parts of a plant or whatever it is i mean those are yeah ones. i that's uh, you saw like when i did the one line of text at a time those were each different slides i just moved one line of text up moved pop the next one in i like that for several reasons one if all else fails and there is complete failure of technology, I can run to Kinko's and print out my slideshow as, as an actual PDF printed out and hand it out. You can't do that with animated, you know, and especially if there's anything that's important in there, you can't do that. So that's one reason, and that's a practical reason. Yeah. From the visual reason, again, depends on your, on your audience. If that's the best way to show that information concisely and clearly, then go for it. There's no reason not to. If it's not the best way, then find a better way. All right, got some more for you. Um, JR says, Eric, regarding time for presentations, let's say 45 minutes. Should be, you be prepared for 45, for just 45 minutes or less in order to finish on time? <laughs> well, it's funny you should ask this because this, <laughs> this original is a cut down version that Dave got to see in San Diego at a conference where I was giving a two hour workshop. And he asked me if I could pare it down to 45 minutes. It's like, okay, well, the best design is redesign and the best writing is rewriting. So here we are. Um, I have from that pare down, even in the pare down one, I have another 10 or 15 slides that I could take 10 or 15 minutes in case I race through this faster than I normally do, which I've gone through this three times now in the past five days paring it down and getting comfortable with my speed so that hopefully I didn't talk too fast, but hopefully I also didn't have awkward long pauses. So that's a good, uh, that that's one thing, practice, rehearse, PowerPoint and key and keynote, make it easy to time yourself and figure it out. Um, so with all of that, shoot for 45 minutes, but be ready to go a little bit longer. Yeah, okay, great, that's good info. Uh, here's a, te a um, text question for you. I've heard that sans serifs are preferred for electronic and serifs for print. What do you think about that general rule? Um, that's miss, honestly. Both of them work well in print. Sans serif actually is, is older than serif in continuous use. Um, they both have very specific... Sans serif was created for low resolution computer displays. And that's what brought it back to the forefront. So back in the day, uh, when I started in computers, which was way too long ago, you didn't have high resolution monitors that could show all the little, could not show well all of the little serifs coming off of Times New Roman or off of uh, Bodoni or any of those, they got lost because the resolution of the dot pitch resolution of the monitors was just too low. And the dot pitch resolution of the printers that weren't daisy wheels, which was basically just an electrified computerized typewriter. Um, and they, I mean, the originals used actual typewriter heads, the rotating spinning typewriter heads. So if it wasn't that type of impact printer, if it was a dot matrix printer, it would lose all of that. And so sans serif fonts made a comeback and became as popular as they were because of that. Modern day monitors, modern day computers with modern day resolution 
there's no difference between them. Print, there's no difference between them. I can print sans serif or serif just as well. They hold up just as well. Um, and so it's actually kind of the opposite. Serif fonts were, or sans serif fonts were, uh, well, actually, that's what you said. Sans serif was preferred for electronic. Yeah, that's what you said. So, so yeah, sans serif was for a while, but there's no reason for it anymore. Um, both of them work just as well in either medium. Eric, we've got a couple more questions. Uh, I'm going to mm -hmm. wrap up our recording here, but if you are willing, we will stay on a little bit longer for folks that want to continue to ask questions. Uh, but otherwise, folks, thank you for coming out today. I'm going to end our recording. This recording will be available on the United States Aquaculture Society YouTube channel, as well as the Aquaculture Education and More YouTube channel. But we appreciate your time and look forward to next month's uh, webinar when we'll be talking about seaweed. So keep your eyes open for that. Thanks again, and we'll see you soon.